Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess. So far in the first 50 some videos, I've only shown one game that was mine that I played in previous times. I have played several games out loud for you in real time against the computer. But the game I showed was a really interesting game. It was the first game I got published, my game against John Davies. And today I'd like to show you a game I played against um, John Yale in the, at the Keystone State Tournament. Let me bring it up here, number 216. Uh, let's try number 226. There we go. Okay, so I'm black. Let's flip the board. Let's set up this game a little bit. Um, I had played Mr. Yale six months earlier, and I had a completely winning position. And I tried too hard to find how good my best move was in a position where I should have just played my best move. And I got confused and tired, and I fell into a checkmate in a winning position. So this was six months later, and it was actually my first really great tournament I ever played. All the best players in Philadelphia were playing. I was rated one past the half. I was, like, if there was, I forget how many players there were. If there was 102 players, I was, like, number 52. And I got paired with the top player in the first round, and I won again, just like I did six months earlier at the Liberty Bell. And after three rounds, there were only two players, 3-0. and oh, And that was uh, Mr. Yale and myself. Uh, I was rated at the time 1716. Mr. Yale was rated in the 1900s. And we were playing on first board. And I was out for a little revenge, so let's see what happened in the game. Mr. Yale played E4. I offered a Sicilian c5, and he offered a Mora Gambit d4. So we're playing, I think, 50 moves in two hours. And I thought for a while, do I want to play a Mora Gambit, or do I want to offer maybe some other type of opening? So I thought for a while, and I played e3, e6. This is an offer to play a Benoni. If white plays d5, then pawn takes, pawn takes, let's say d6. It, knight c3 would be the check Benoni. The main Benoni would be c4, knight f6, knight c3, g6, and so on. So that's what I'm offering. I'm offering a Benoni. So Mr. Yale thought for a while, and he decided he did not want a Benoni. And he plays knight to f3. And now if I take the pawn, I guess he could offer a delayed Mora Gambit which I assumed he would do if he offered a more gamut to begin with. Or he could just take the pawn and we could go into some sort of e6 variation of the open Sicilian. Uh, I decided to keep playing kind of non-bookie moves, and I played a move that I understood wasn't very good. I played d5, and now all of a sudden Stockfish jumps up and says, if white plays this correctly, white has a big advantage. And the reason is that he can check and castle and threaten to check me with rook e1 very quickly. He can play pawn takes, and now if I take with the queen, he can start chasing my queen around the board. But if I take with the pawn and he checks, and I play knight c6 and he castles, it's going to be hard for my bishop to continue to guard this pawn and for me to castle before he plays rook e1 check. Um, computer actually says it's even more accurate here for him to play instead of castles, a move like either c4, which is a move I've never seen in this position, or maybe the beginner-looking move, knight to e5, just putting pressure on c6. And white's better. So if we go back to the game, uh, white decided in the game to just take the pawn and let me develop the bishop. And Stockfish says that's not the right way to play it, even though I get an isolated pawn. I get a chance to develop my bishop with tempo, and that makes all the difference. Now black's pretty equal. So I take the pawn back. He takes the pawn. I do not want to go into an end game down a pawn. I'd much rather play with the isolated pawn in the middle game. So I take with the pawn. And he plays bishop b5 check. Stockfish thinks that just playing bishop d3 is more accurate. I develop with knight c6. He castles. Now I don't want to play knight f6 because of his rook e1 check. But Stockfish says it's okay. Stockfish says if knight f6, rook e1 check, bishop e6, if he plays knight to g5, I can just give him this pawn. 
castle. If knight takes e6, f takes e6. Rook takes e6, loses to bishop takes f2, check. And if king takes f2, knight e4, check. And now he's in big trouble. King g1, queen b6, check. And he's got to watch out for even uh, Philidor's legacy here, much less losing his queen. So I didn't see that, of course. So I just played knight g7 so that it, if he plays rook e1, I could castle. He does play knight c3, hitting the pawn. I could castle here. I could play a6. I play bishop to g4. Computer says not the best move because now he could play h3. Instead, white plays rook e1, pinning the knight and threatening either knight takes d5 or queen takes d5. So, of course, I need to unpin my knight. So I actually unpin both my knights by castling. All right, so here... Stockfish thinks the game is even, and it actually thinks white's next move, which I thought was a mistake, is okay. White plays bishop d3, threatening bishop takes h7, check, king takes h7, knight g5, check, followed by queen takes g4, winning a pawn. Thinks I should counterattack here with queen to b6, which I didn't like, maybe because of Either knight a4 or just guarding the pawn first, threatening knight a4. So I played an anti-positional move, and I knew my next move was anti-positional, but I thought it was okay. Turns out, if white plays it right, it's not so okay. So I played the kind of weakening move f5. Notice how that really weakens my e6 and e5 squares. And the right way for white to take advantage of this is to play first play h3, and if I play bishop h5, he should just play the calm move bishop e2 and slowly undo his pieces this way. If he does that, then white has a nice little positional advantage. Instead, he does play h3, but for a completely different reason that's completely unsound. He does this so that he can sacrifice his kingside pawns and play bishop takes h7 check. So I play bishop h5. And after some thought, he plays g4. And now he's expecting pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, bishop takes h7, king takes h7, knight g5, check. King moves, queen takes g4 with a nice game. But I've seen a little further. I played pawn takes. He plays pawn takes. I play bishop takes. And now to his horror, he realizes that if he plays bishop h7, check, I can just play king h8, and he has no safe moves to guard the knight on f3, and he could just resign. So now he has to backtrack, and white plays bishop e2. So white's completely lost here, and all black has to do is play a bunch of calm moves. For instance, here, Stockfish's number one move is queen c7, threatening the sneaky pin, Queen g3 check. For instance, knight takes d5. Queen g3 check. He can't go king f1 because the queen takes f2 mate. King h1. Bishop f3. Bishop f3. Queen h4 check. King over. Queen takes f2 check. King h1. And now just rook takes f3. Crush. Mate in 7. So I don't have to do anything fancy here. I'm up a pawn with a good game. His king is exposed. If I play a move like queen to d6 or queen to c7 or even queen e8 threatening queen g6, I'm just winning. And that's what I should do. One of the principles I teach my students is when you're easily winning, keep it simple. And here, keeping the queens on the board and, you know, keeping my extra pawn and going against his open king is the simple way to play. But I was kind of out for revenge, and I wasn't uh, into as much what I learned later, which is when you're winning, keep it simple. So I thought I found a nice complicated move that would win the game, and it did, indeed it does win the game, but it it unnecessarily complicates the position. So just like in that Eliekin Rubinstein game where Eliekin said, don't, don't do what I do here because normally it's not a good idea, I'm going to tell you the same thing in this position. 
what I'm about to do, when you're killing someone like this, you shouldn't be doing stuff like what I just did, what, what I'm about to do here. And what I did was I played bishop takes f2 check. I thought maybe after king takes f2 I could play knight e5 and get my piece back. And that's true, but it's a lot more complicated than that. So I play bishop takes f2 check, which isn't bad. It's just completely unnecessary. He, of course, has to take, and I play knight e5, hitting the knight for a third time, and he can't really guard it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to be good here. But then while I was sitting there thinking, I realized, uh-oh, what do I do if he plays bishop g5? And then he sacrifices his queen and then plays bishop takes e7. So let me show you the line that I was worried about while he was thinking. I was worried about bishop g5, <clears throat> knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, rook takes f3 check, queen takes f3, bishop takes f3, bishop takes e7. And now I don't have any moves that I can play to guard my bishop on f3. For instance, queen b6 check. King takes f3, and he's got a rook and two pieces for the queen and a couple pawns. I wasn't sure I really wanted to go into this. No, Stockfish says that black is still up by about three pawns here. And if Stock, Stockfish says, if I play a much better move than queen b6, if I play queen d7, then after king f3, I can play d4. Now he has to, he has to move the knight in such a way that his rook will continue to guard the bishop. So he has to play something like knight d1, and then I can play rook c8, getting my rook in the game, and I'm completely winning. But I didn't see any of this. It's very, very difficult to look at all those lines. <clears throat> so while I was thinking about that, he did play bishop g5. And now I sat there thinking, boy, I'm playing 50 moves in two hours. I wish I had five hours. It's not too many games that I've ever played where I wish I had a lot more time than what they gave me, especially if it's a two-hour game. But here I sat there and and thought for, you know, 15, 20, 25 minutes. And I've been thinking for a long time on every move here because it's so complicated. And now I thought, uh-oh, what do I do? Well, it turns out if I play bishop f3 and he plays bishop f3 and I play, let's say, knight takes f3 and then he plays bishop takes e7, I can play knight takes e1 discovered check. And in, he's in check, he has to take, and then I can just take the bishop check and I'm up the exchange and a couple pawns with a big attack. Unfortunately, I didn't calculate that quite right because there were so many capturing com permutations here. I was going through rook takes f3, knight takes f3, bishop takes f3, and after I would take, I had to look at his recaptures on f3 and his captures on e7. This is a really good example of a very complicated counting tactic where I am winning material with the right sequence of play, but there's an awful lot of permutations of captures here. And I was getting very tired looking at the board. I, I simultaneously wished I had more time so I could figure this out better, but I also wished uh, that I would get this over with because I was getting tired from all the calculation here. So there's just a tremendous number of permutations of captures. So I thought for a long time and I played queen to b6 check with the idea that if he plays king to f1, I have bishop h3 checkmate on the move. But if he does anything else, I can capture with check now. He's not Bishop takes e7 is no longer hitting my knight. For instance, if he plays king to g2 to guard his knight, then knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes check. If he plays queen takes, I can play rook takes. And now he can't take the knight and take the rook, if he plays bishop takes e7, I have, of course, queen f2 check with mate on the next move. So that was the idea is he can't move the king. And if he can't move the king, he can't put the knight in the way. It's illegal. He can't put the queen in a way because I just take it off. It's a sneaky pin. The knight's pinned and is not guarding the queen. So his only move is to play the move he did, which is bishop at e3 hitting my queen. But now... I had already calculated that I could play the move queen to f6, hitting the pin knight again and also threatening the sneaky pin, queen h4 check, which just destroys his position. He's got a million ways to lose pieces there. The computer says that actually my best move is queen to c6, but that's a move I never even considered. So I played queen f6. And of course, this is just winning too, even though 
Queen C6 is minus 9 on Stockfish. Uh, queen F6 is about minus 9 also. So White has no defense here. I mean, he could resign. But there's a lot of complications. And last time he played me, uh, I was winning and I blundered and he won. So why should he resign? Uh, it's a good, a good idea for him to play on here. So he plays Rook H1 to stop that Queen H4 check. If he lets me play Queen H4 check, his, all his pieces are going to fall off. So now it looks like I can win the knight on f3. I've got four pieces attacking it. He's only got three guarding it. And I start by playing bishop takes f3. And he plays bishop takes f3. And now I could just win my piece back with knight takes f3. Stockfish says my best move is queen e6. And that's a move, you know, again, I wouldn't even look at. It's, it's, it seems crazy to play that move. I played a move which also wins. And it's a little cuter than knight takes f3. I played knight g4 check. And now he's got lots of king moves, but they all lose. For instance, if he plays king to g2 or king to f1, then I simply play knight takes e3 check, winning back my piece, forking his king and his queen. If he plays king to g1, I can play knight to e3, and that guards the pawn. So that if he plays a move like knight takes d5, I can start checking him here with queen g5 check. I could also, well, I have a lot of ways of playing this. I could play knight takes d5 as well. So if he plays king g3, I was planning to play the cute move knight f5 check. And Stockfish now says that's the best move. Very cute move. The idea of this move is if he goes to g2, I fork him again. If he takes my knight, king takes g4, I fork his king and his queen again. And if he goes to the h file, I get to bring my queen up with check. And it's going to be mate in two. Check him with this knight. And wherever he goes, I have checkmate. So that's what I would have played if he had played king to g3. So instead, my opponent realizes that king to g3... I don't know if he thought after king g3 I was just going to play knight takes e3, but even if I do play knight takes e3, I'm completely winning. It's just not as cute as knight f5 check. So he decides to uncastle his king and play king to e1. All right, so now I think sounds like about time to win my piece back, but I have to make sure that he can't checkmate me with like knight d5 Knight takes bishop checks, king h8, rook h7 check, and queen h5 mate. Luckily, I have a queen on f6, so that doesn't work. So I played knight takes e3. He played knight takes d5. I played knight on 7 takes d5. This is all the line I just gave you if you didn't follow it. Bishop takes check. And now the line I, I made sure I, you don't want to lose the game on one big blunder. For instance, if my queen was not on f6, then king h8, Rook h7 check, king h7, queen h5 would be checkmate. Luckily for me, or I shouldn't say luckily because I did calculate this, my queen is on f6 and I can just play queen h6 and he's just down a rook and his king's caught in the middle. <clears throat> so I allowed him to do this. I played, if we go back to the game, after bishop takes d5 check, I did not take with the knight. I want to leave the knight up here to help attack the king. I just took a few minutes to make sure king h8 was safe, and I played king h8. And now since rook takes h7 check doesn't work, what else can he do? He's completely lost. I'm threatening queen f2 mate. I'm also threatening knight takes d1. <clears throat> so he did the best he could. He played queen to d2, which continues to guard the knight, and it stops the mate. Stockfish here says my best move is to play rook a e8. Just for the fun of it, let's force that move. Let's see how far ahead I am. Right now he says I'm 66 pawns ahead. Usually if it's 66 pawns ahead, he'll see a checkmate soon. Uh, now he's up to 79 move ahead. Uh, mate in 32. Now he's down to mate in 22. Mate in 22. Okay, so uh, I would have mate in 22, but I, I didn't look at anything like that, of course. I simply said, all right, I'm going to pin his queen to his king. I took off the bishop, and now I'm threatening rook checks. 
he did what a lot of good players do, which he said, look, I'm going to take off your knight because if I don't take it off, I'm down a piece and I can resign. Knowing full well that I'm going to win, but if he doesn't give me the piece, if he doesn't take back the piece, then it's hopeless anyway. So he took the piece. I checked him on F2. The computer says that my best move was rook ad8 with mate in 7. I played queen f2 check. He plays king d1. And I play rook ad8 pinning his queen to his king. Stockfish says I now have mate in 6. For instance, let's say he tries to save the queen with c4. Rook takes d5 check. If pawn takes, queen d4 check. King c2, rook f2 check. Doesn't matter which square he goes to. King b3, rook checks, king a3, queen b4 checkmate. All right, so let's go through the game real quickly. <clears throat> you can see it has a certain flow to it. e4, c5, offers a Mora Gambit. Declines, offers a Benoni. Declines, offer another Sicilian. Plays a poor variation of a Sicilian. Doesn't punish black as much as he should. <clears throat> Now we have a fairly equal position, both sides developing their pieces. White plays there. I thought that was might have been a little bit of a mistake. It violates the principle move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. But actually Stockfish says it's as good as anything. Now I play a bad move, f5. White plays h3, which is actually not a bad move. It just starts a bad plan. I play bishop h5, and now he makes the losing move. G4, terrible move. I take, he takes, I take, and now bishop h7, check, king h8, loses the knight on f3. He goes back, and now I play something that I, I wouldn't do today, which is I complicated the game when I was winning. Not a good idea. You should keep it simple when you're winning. I'm out for revenge. He takes, I go there. He plays bishop g5, willing to give up his queen for a rook and two pieces. I thought that was too much, although it turns out the computer says I would have been okay. So I check. He plays bishop f6. I pin the knight. Now I'm winning my piece back. I'm threatening queen h4 check. He plays rook h1 to stop that check, but now I can win the piece on f3. I take. He takes. And now I could just take on f3 and win. But I play knight there, which is... It, that I would do today because I'm winning the piece back anyway. But I'm winning it back much better than I am if I just take it. Oops, MC Soft says I have no, no malware. Sorry about that interruption. Um, so knight g4 check. He really doesn't have any moves. He plays king e1. Everything loses. Obviously, if he plays king e2, queen takes f3 check, and I'm taking off all his pieces. It's mate in two. Everything's bad, as I pointed out earlier. King g3, knight f5 check is cute, which is what I would have played, but I would have taken my time to make sure it really worked. After king e1, I said, finally, I'll win back my piece. Now I have to make sure he's not sacrificing his rook to checkmate me. I go there. He decides not to sacrifice the rook because it's not made. It just loses a rook. But unfortunately, all his moves lose. I just decide to go win his queen and checkmate him later using Donald Burns' rule, although I hadn't yet gone to uh, to college to meet Donald Burns. So uh, Donald Burns' rule, if you haven't heard of it, is if you see a way to, to win his queen, and then you look around and you think, maybe I have a better way that I can checkmate him, the answer is just win his queen first. He'll resign. If he doesn't, you'll win, him, win anyway. But if you play for checkmate and you play it wrong and you end up messing up the game, you're going to kick yourself forever. So... Unbeknownst to me, I learned that rule from Professor Byrne a year or two later. Un unbeknownst to me, I'm following Professor Byrne's rule. I'm just winning the queen here. And, of course, my opponent in this completely hopeless position resigns. Okay, so this is uh, Yale Heisman. I hate to tell you that it was played at the Keystone State Open in 1968, but I am proud to tell you that I sent this game into Chess Life, and this was the first game that I ever played that was published in Chess Life magazine. So uh, very proud of that. And this was my first great tournament. I gained 200 rating points in this tournament because of the bonus points. I think my rating went up from like 1716 to 1927. I, finished, I started the tournament 5-0 and in a seven-round tournament. And I was paired up all five rounds, and I won all five rounds. It's probably the only time I've ever done that.
was be, was being paired up five rounds in a row and winning five rounds in a row. Okay, for my YouTube channel, this is Dan Heisman. Hope you enjoyed this exciting game. It was very exciting playing it. It was hard on my, uh, my nerves a little bit, but uh, great showing it to you now. See you next time. Thanks. Bye.